This thing is 15 meters high, 20 meters long, it weighs 14,000 tons, and contains enough iron to build two Eiffel Towers. And it's, it's absolutely phenomenal. But this is the standard model, and the main point about it is it's stupendously successful. So it describes every measurement we've ever made, pretty much. And there was actually a, just a result that came out on Tuesday this week, which is a kind of flagship you know, why the standard model is brilliant. What they, there's an experiment in the United States where they measure how magnetic an electron is. It's very clever. You basically trap a single electron in a little sort of a, a little bottle, effectively, and you measure its magnetism. And when you do that, you get a number that you can measure to 12 decimal places. So, so it's a one part in a trillion. It's an incredibly precise measurement. You can use a standard model to predict how magnetic a muon should be, an electron should be, rather, and you get the same number to 12 significant figures. So it's an absolutely unbelievable level of agreement. There is no theory anywhere in science that comes anywhere close to being this mo precisely uh, sort of verified. Yet we know this theory is incomplete and, and in some sense wrong because it only describes 5% of the universe. So in this rather puzzling position. So uh, what we do at CERN is we, what we're really trying to do is to find places where this standard model breaks down, where the particles don't behave in the way they ought to. And the way we do this is using this giant instrument, the Large Hadron Collider. So here's a shot of CERN outside Geneva. You can see the, the route of the Large Hadron Collider marked on the countryside. It's 27 kilometers. It starts over here by the airport, goes right round to the Jura Mountains. You can see uh, Lake Geneva over here. And what it does, um, is uh, really quite simple and brutal. Essentially, it's the sort of most simple-minded kind of science you can think of. We want to know what the world is made from, so we take little bits of it, we accelerate them to incredibly high speeds, 99.999999% of the speed of light, and then you crash these particles into each other. And what you, you're doing there really is you're actually, in some sense, uh, creating, where well, you are creating, new forms of matter that haven't existed since the Big Bang. So this machine is really a machine that makes particles from energy. And that's why you need to get these things up to very, very high speeds. The more energy you have, the, the heavier the particles you can make. If you go down into the tunnel, this is what you see. Um, a very, very, very long blue tube curving away into the distance. Um, this is the accelerator itself. It's essentially the world's largest and most expensive thermos flask. So um, in, well, this is actually a cryostat. So it's a, it's a vessel that contains superfluid liquid helium cooled to minus 271 degrees Celsius. The reason it's so cold is because the way you steer the particles around the ring are using very powerful electromagnets. And the only way you can make a magnet powerful enough to bend these particles traveling at pretty much the speed of light is if the coils that make them up are made of a superconductor. This is a material that has no electrical resistance. And that means you can put huge electric currents through your magnetic coils and get a very big magnetic field but this only works at very low temperatures. Um, to give you a sense of the challenges involved with this machine, when you cool something that's 27 kilometers down by 271 degrees, well, actually, someone, probably, someone will answer this question. What happens when you cool a piece of metal down? Does anyone know? It shrinks. It shrinks. So you cool a 27 kilometer piece of metal down, it shrinks by 30 meters. So this whole machine has to be able to flex under its own thermal contraction, which is just one of the incredible things about it. And I, I, it's amazing that the engineers who built it got it to work, to be honest. And then this is sort of the business end of the LHC. So this is a photograph of one of the detectors. So at four points around this ring, the particles are brought into collision. And what you want to do when that happens is you want to image that collision. You want to record it, see what happened. The way you do this is with instruments like this. Um, this is the compact muon solenoid experiment. Uh, I always thought it was a strange use of the word compact. Um, <laughs> This thing is 15 meters high, 20 meters long, it weighs 14,000 tons, and contains enough iron to build two Eiffel Towers. And it's, it's absolutely phenomenal. You know, just to give you a sense of scale, this is a person with a hard hat just there. Um, and every part of this is you know, the most precise engineered microelectronics that can image particles down at the sort of micron level of precision. So it's an incredibly sophisticated 3D camera, effectively, that takes photographs of the collisions in three dimensions and it does this 40 million times every second. So you have collisions 40 million times a second, about nine months of the year, 24 hours a day. This is what happens when you have a collision. This is, these are two protons having a very bad day. So they crash into each other. The protons are obliterated, and the energy they're carrying is converted into new particles. So a lot of what you're seeing here are particles coming flying out 
that were created from the energy of that collision. Some of what you're seeing is the innards of the proton, but most of it's actually new stuff that wasn't there to start with. You may, if you've at all followed the science news, you probably know that 10 years ago, CERN achieved its sort of uh, major, the LHC had its major achievement, which was the discovery uh, of the Higgs boson. And this is um, a photograph from that day, the 4th of July, 2012. This is as excited as you'll ever see particle physicists getting. Um, so, you know, there was whooping, cheering. I think someone described it as being like at a football match. I'm not sure they'd ever been to an actual football match, but... <laughs> It was, it was certainly pretty lively by physics standards anyway. And so the discovery of the Higgs was a big deal. I won't go into that because that's not what the talk's about. But the story since then really has been that what we were hoping for in a way, the Higgs was the last piece of the standard model that hadn't been found. So it was a bit of unfinished business, if you like, from the 20th century. What we were really hoping to find were dark matter particles, something that might explain how matter and antimatter you know, uh, interacted in the early universe. But actually, the story of the last 10 years has really been the fact that we haven't seen any new particles. Lots of, there was lots of optimism when I started out as a PhD student, but you know, as we've made more and more measurements with more and more data, nothing has really appeared. And this has left people feeling quite anxious in general about the future of fundamental physics, because this huge machine that was supposed to give us all these answers to these big questions, so far at least, hasn't given us many clues. But what I want to tell you about just in the last sort of last few minutes of the talk uh, is about some intriguing results that we've been getting just in the last few years that may be hinting at the beginnings of uh, what could be quite a, a major breakthrough. So um, the first uh, set of results came out last uh, March, on March uh, 23rd uh, last year. These were results from the experiment that I work on, which is called LHCB, another one of the big detectors at CERN. So there are four of these, and this is one of them. It doesn't look quite as attractive as CMS. It looks a bit more like a multicolored toast rack, but it's a very clever detector. And what this uh, detector does is it studies particles uh, called beauty quarks. So a beauty quark is, there are six quarks. We're made of up and down quarks, and then there are four others that don't exist normally, but you can make them in collider experiments. And beauty quarks are very interesting because we can produce them in very large numbers at the LHC. We produce billions and billions of them every year. And that means you can make very precise measurements of their properties. And uh, one of the ways that we can look for the hidden influence of new uh, forces, for example, is by measuring how these particles decay, so when they disintegrate and turn into other things, and then compare that to the state-of-the-art predictions from our current theory, the standard model. So you have a theoretical prediction, you have a, an experimental measurement, and you compare them. And if they're different, if there's a difference between them, that can indicate that there is something new that's affecting how these beauty particles decay, which can be a clue to the existence of new forces, for example. So, um, so as I said, yeah, so you can, you, with the known forces that we already know about, we can say, if we imagine this is a beauty quark, this green blob, and then this yellow thing and these two red things are some other particles, we can calculate how often, say, this process ought to happen, and then see how often it happens. But if there is a new force, let's imagine there's a, a fifth force of nature that we've not seen before. That fifth force can provide an additional route for the beauty quark to decay, and that will subtly change how it decays, say how often it decays, or it could also change the angles that these three particles come flying out at. They might have a different distribution depending on what's causing the decay to happen. The particularly exciting result that came out in March was essentially doing something quite simple, where you take some beauty quarks and you look at their decay where they turn into something called a strange quark, which is the next lightest one, and then an electron and an anti-electron. The main thing is to notice there's some electrons here. Okay, that's the key thing. And then we, do a, we look at another decay where you switch the electrons for muons. Now, if you remember, I said that muons are like copies of the electron. They're just heavier. They're 200 times heavier, but in all other ways, they're identical. And because they're identical, the forces of nature treat them the same. So we expect the beauty quark to decay into electrons equally as often as it decays into muons. So a very good test of the standard model is just to count how many of these things we see, how many of these things we see, and see if they're the same. And if they're not the same, that could indicate a new force, because there's nothing in the standard model that can, can make a difference, essentially, between these two sets of particles. Um, and indeed, that's what we found. So we found, uh, my colleagues found last March, um, effectively, that there, is a, there seems to be a difference between how often these processes are happening. And it's at a statistical significance, which means that there is about a one in a thousand chance that this result is a fluke. Um, so it's a little bit like, imagine you're 
trying to figure out if a coin is a, is a fair coin. So you toss that coin repeatedly. Let's say you toss it 10 times. This equivalent to getting 10 heads in a row. So I think if you had a coin, you tossed it 10 times and got 10 heads, you think, hmm, this coin's probably a bit dodgy. Um, but the problem with particle physics is we don't just toss one coin 10 times. We're tossing thousands of coins many, many times. So you expect when you do lots of measurements, some of them to sort of deviate from your theory, some of them just by random chance. So we're not yet at the threshold where we can say for sure that this is a real effect, but it's definitely getting really quite interesting and could be indicating this is the first sort of imprint of a new force. The other thing that makes this quite exciting is that about literally, uh, you know, you had no new physics for 10 years and then two come along like buses within the space of about a month of each other. Another result from an experiment in America in Fermilab where they measured the magnetism of the muon. So the same part, this muon again, the same troublesome particle. And uh, this is an experiment just near Chicago. Uh, just, uh, I was actually there in July. Very impressive piece of kit. Go and see it if you can. This is what it looks like. It's a big ring. So basically, what they not quite as big as the LHC. This is the sort of, you can see some people here. So it's not 27 kilometers long, but it's still very impressive. And what they do is they send muons around this ring. And as they go around the ring, they measure how magnetic they are. Um, and what they found is that the, again, just like the electron, the muon has a magnetic field. And you can calculate how strong the magnetism of the muon should be from the known laws of physics, from the known ingredients of our universe. And what they found when they measured this is that these two numbers were different. Again, the muon was slightly more magnetic than it ought to be. And this time, the statistical significance meant there's about a 1 in 40,000 chance of this being a fluke. So this is a bit like tossing 15 heads in a row. So spectacularly unlikely. So it's starting to look like potentially there's something really interesting going on here. And the fact that both of these measurements involve these weird muon things suggests there may be a common explanation, perhaps involving a new force of nature. So yeah, it's a really exciting moment. We've, we've got these big mysteries that we don't understand. We don't know what most of the universe is made from. We don't know how we exist. We don't know why we exist. And we've, been spend, we've spent you know, much of the last 50 years trying to get some crack, some clue that will lead us into the next sort of stage of development where we will actually start to be able to answer these questions. And these anomalies are still very uncertain. It's not really clear which way they're going to go. There is a po there's always a possibility with these sorts of measurements that there's some mistake in the experiment or maybe even a mistake in your theoretical calculation. There's a famous example of this from a few years ago where someone missed a minus sign. It's like a classic school, school, school child error. And that actually, we thought there was an anomaly, but there wasn't. It was just a stray minus sign. We don't think there are mistakes like that in this case, and the fact they're all sort of lining up with each other is rather intriguing. If it does turn out to be true, it's going to be the biggest breakthrough, I think, in fundamental physics for the best part of two or three decades. It will really be the start of a new journey of discovery, because it's very unlikely that if there is a new particle out there or a new force, that it's on its own. It's probably part of a much larger family that will be connected potentially to the mystery of dark matter or to the origins of matter in the very early universe. Um, but we'll have to wait and see. We should get more data and more results in the, in the near future, in the next few years. So this puzzle will be hopefully resolved one way or another. Um, but if you found this interesting, keep your eyes peeled on the sort of science press because we may be on the brink of a really exciting moment in our understanding of the universe. Thanks very much for your attention. podcasts, talks, debates, courses and articles, visit the Institute of Art and Ideas. Click the link on screen now to iai.tv.